My name is Rose Cartwright, I'm a writer and a creative director and I'm going to be talking to you today about how to make it in the creative industries, how to make it as a writer when you have no financial safety net. Writing is a really difficult industry to get into if you're not from money um, because a lot of the work that you're doing is often on spec. Um, you're often pitching with no guarantee of any income at all. So how do you do that when you're broke and when everyone in your family is broke? I'm going to be talking you through my career and how I got to the point of being able to make a living from my writing. Um, and I'm going to be giving you some hints and tips and I'm going to be answering some questions as well. So a little bit about me, about my career. Um, uh, today I work as a writer, a creative director, um, I'm an author in that I've written one book so far, I suspect at some point I'll write another one but not yet because my main focus right now is uh, screenwriting. Um, I've written three pilots and two of those pilots are in development. Um, in the past I've written short films and short stories and articles and I've also done a lot of commercial work for brands. So really um, in terms of writing, I'm a jack of all trades, I've kind of done it all. I hope this session will be useful for, well, for anyone who's curious about uh, the arc of a writing career. I mean, I'm using past tense, like, you know, I'm fucking retired, I'm only 34, but uh, you know, I, the, the the arc of a career that goes from basically being completely unestablished and scraping around for pennies and um, having security and having a sense of satisfaction in my work. Um, at no point was it obvious that A would get to B. I hope this will be useful for anybody who is at the start of their career and who is broke and who is wanting to make a living out of writing but uh wondering how the hell you climb this mountain because it is this very smoke and mirrors industry like until you're in it you just it's it's very impenetrable there are a couple of romantic tropes associated with being a writer and one of them is the kind of uh down and out tortured artist who is sustained by their work um, and is happy to go hungry if only they can get their voice out into the world. The other one is the kind of effete socialite who swans about literary salons um, and doesn't ever have to worry about an income because grandpapa was a count. <laughs> if you come from a low income background, uh, the latter is not an option for you, so forget that. Uh, but I'd argue that the, the sort of the struggling artist is also not all it's cracked up to be either. Um, it's true that being poor can put fire in your belly and, and fuel your creativity, but over time it can also be very corrosive. Stress is not good for your system and it can be really difficult to write through stress. I think it's really easy to idealise and romanticise this idea of being penniless but an artist. Um, but anyone who's been there knows that it's actually really fucking hard. So what I am going to try and do today is um, is talk you through how to get balance in your writing career between being sustained financially but also creatively. So at school, I was told I would be a teacher or a journalist, both of which sounded really incredibly boring to me. Um, and when I left school, I did an internship at the Birmingham Post. Um, and I remember I wrote an article about um, men in suits. I think it was the, called something like the, the strange allure of men in suits, which really isn't that strange if you think about it. <laughs> but yeah, it was basically all about how, as a 16 year old, I had a massive crush on Christian and Guru Murthy and Jeremy Paxman. Um, and they published it. And that was the first thing that I got published. Uh, I remember being very proud of that. Um, I then went to university to study English um, and I want to talk to you in more depth later about university and the question of whether or whether to study writing, whether not to, whether to get a degree because I don't think that's a given for, for people from low income backgrounds. It's um, that's a huge amount of money to invest and uh, it's a big question whether or not it's worth it. Um, I studied English, I basically fucked around for four years. Um, when I went to university, um, at the time, uh, the, the family, I, I should probably, I should probably just paint a picture of, 
um, the family finances anyway without going into too much detail. I don't want to over egg the pudding by virtue of the fact of being born a white woman in a racist country, a straight woman in a homophobic country, a cis woman in a transphobic country. You know, my privilege has been huge um, and I'm well aware of that. I have my eyes open to that. Ways in which I did struggle uh, were that uh, there was a lot of very serious mental ill health in my family um, and there was no money and for large swathes of especially my teenage years um, there was a lot of reliance on benefits, incapacity benefit, dad being on the dole, um, I was one of four kids so it was just it was very stretched and very stressful and um, when I applied for uni I obviously got maximum loan because it because it was all means tested which uh, in one sense was a good thing because it meant that I got four grand a year which at the time was a vast fortune but also kind of a bad thing because um, you have to pay it back <laughs> and I don't think anyone ever really explained that to me uh, or, or I hadn't fully grasped that I hadn't fully grasped what three or in fact what ended up being four years at four grand a year would would actually cost me in the long run you know I, I came out of it I, it would I did four years because I dropped out because I was mentally ill myself so my next thing after my infamous Krishnan Guru Murthy article was uh, I was writing um, a fashion blog which was like a satire on the kind of oily excesses of fashion editorial which I just found really nauseating even though I loved reading Vogue I was just like are these people real uh, and it was called Fashion Tosh and I pitched it to um, Private Eye as a column and uh, they weren't interested but I got, a, I got a note back from the editor and it just said good but not for us Ed and it was my first rejection letter and I was really proud of it after uni, I put my literature degree to great use. Um, I started working in a call centre in a bank. <laughs> and um, I was supposed to be collecting debt. Um, I got the sack from there because um, after five months, I didn't collect a single bit of debt from anybody because I just, just didn't have the heart. Um, but but what I did do while I was there is I, 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 wrote, I wrote on their time, which I didn't feel guilty about at all. I was writing little hundred word reviews of um, bars and clubs and restaurants in Birmingham. Um, and that, doing that, spinning those plates, again, I was always just trying to find ways to write on the side of earning money. What that did was that um, when I saw an advert come up for an internship in London to write reviews for a kind of timeout rival, now extinct, um, that I had some experience, I had some little clippings that I could say, look, I've done this before. Um, so thanks, RBS, <laughs> you pricks. So I moved down to London. I say moved down, I didn't have anywhere to move. Um, I, I lived on people's sofas and in their beds for three months. There was just no way that I could afford rent. I got paid £25 a week <laughs> uh, for my efforts on the electronic music desk. And sometimes they didn't even pay me. I remember causing like a big stink because uh, I was sort of like, I'd, I had to nag the editor for I think for about the third time that week. And I was like, I'm really, really sorry, but would it be is it, is it possible that I could get my 25 pounds and he fucking lost it not at me but he went into the CEO's office and was just like are you serious you're not paying this 22 year old her 25 pounds a week um anyway that wasn't enough to live on so I was also I'd skive off uh once a week and go and sign on the doll down in Hoxton and it was really fun I got to write reviews about shit and go to stuff for free uh, which I highly recommend if you want to be a, a junior writer, like try and review stuff because you get sent shit and it's great. <laughs> I remember my friend at this company and I, he got, um, we went to, we got sent on this like PR trip to this like country estate <laughs> and um, she got a bag of coke in, like tour around on like a golf cart of this like five star hotel. <laughs> and we had this like um, Michelin star meal uh which was just i don't know 500 quid a head or whatever 
obviously we weren't paying for it at 22 and um, it was the first time that I experienced morals not like your moral compass but the mushroom my time at the events guide was quite short-lived it's three months long and then after that I was just looking for basically any work and I saw that this company called Groupon um, was looking for <laughs> looking for writers to write their advertorial copy which was just so shockingly bad I can't even put it into work like the copy uh the writing was horrific but I was like look if they're gonna pay me to write this tribe I'm on board um so I got my first like salaried writing job and it was decent and um I made friends there that I still have today and for that um I'll be eternally grateful. All through this time I was experiencing very severe OCD. I was having intrusive thoughts, intrusive sexual thoughts, intrusive doubts about my sexuality, intrusive violent thoughts um, and I was almost not able to work. I was so ill. I'd already dropped out of uni once. I was self-harming, I was bulimic. It was a really bad bad time in my life and of course I was broke um, and I, you know, it's funny, I talk about adverse experiences putting like a fire in your belly. Like I think without all of that, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't be where I am in my career now because um, I had this story to tell that I knew had never been told before. And that was like catnip for me. Like I was young, I was ambitious. I was like, I have to get this story out of me. So having been pitching stuff for years like stupid little content pieces and features and uh, op-eds which of course no one was interested in because I had nothing interesting to say <laughs> apart from this one story about uh, this secret mental health catastrophe that um, I've been sitting on for 10 years and I pitched it to The Guardian and they decided to run it on their front page and that's, that was a really turning point in my career because that article became the book that I wrote, Pure, and then Pure, the book, became Pure, the TV show, which you may have seen on Channel 4 and Netflix over the past year. Uh, and since then, I have been spinning two plates. I have been building what I call the creative side of my career, which is, which includes Pure and um, my screenwriting career. And the stuff that just comes from this deep part of me, just from somewhere below my heart, down, deep down in the pit of my stomach. And the more lucrative, um, but more soul destroying commercial side of my career. Um, so I'm a creative director as well in commercial land, in ad land. Now at the point in my career where I have representation from agents both in the UK and the US, and I am writing original pilot screenplays and uh, selling them, which is amazing, which uh, finally I've kind of managed to marry the lucrative side with the the creative side it took it took 10 years <laughs> so buckle up because um it's a long road i have at the top of my list here write books uh which quite frankly i don't even know why i've included <laughs> unless you're shifting serious thousands of copies um it's going to be really really hard for you to sustain yourself financially let alone a family off of publishing i've also written ghost writing on my list yeah if you want i don't know why you would want to uh do a bunch of work and let someone else take the credit for it but i guess sometimes it's just nice to sit back and work on something almost like a brief um, at a bit of a distance with a bit of objectivity rather than bleeding on the page all the time, which is it, which is what, what um, novel writing and memoir writing feels like. You can be a journalist, of course. Um, and remember there's all sorts of different types of specialism, specialisms in journalism from like fashion or food or travel. Um, you know, reporting is very different to feature writing or being a columnist. 
you know, I think most columnists and feature writers uh, have uh, done their time as juniors uh, doing the less glamorous stuff. It's that's a long road too, but hugely rewarding if you can stick it out. I couldn't. <laughs> I, my, I I ended at the Birmingham Post with with my men in suits piece. Um, you can go into editing, um, be a, a newspaper editor or magazine editor, online editor. Uh, but again, like a lot of editors have come up through the ranks of journalism anyway. Um, you could go into copywriting. Um, Bill Hicks said some very unkind things about people who work in marketing. <laughs> uh, he basically said, if you work in marketing, kill yourself. <laughs> He's like, rid the world of your evil machinations and kill yourself, which I can kind of empathise with because I've worked in marketing for 10 years. Um, but um, it can be a good yin to the yang of uh, doing creative work that is meaningful. I wouldn't have had the time or the resources to, for example, uh, be part of um, Made of Millions, the mental health nonprofit I co-founded, or I wouldn't have had time to write Pure, or have had time to devote to all the speculative scripts that I've pitched if it wasn't for advertising. So I owe it that, um, but um, that's where my affection sort of ends. <laughs> um, if you go into junior copywriting though, straight out of uni, you could be on 200, 220 pounds a day, um, which when I was straight out of uni was a fortune to me. Um, that's if you're freelance, of course. And, you know, 10 years later, you're looking to double that or even more. So it makes sense financially, but you know, can you stomach it? That's another question. Another sort of adjacent route to going into copywriting and advertising is you could go and get work at a production company, which I always really enjoyed. I started working at production companies when I was in my mid twenties. Um, you'd go and get a runner job or even a receptionist job and just like pay attention to what people are doing and the conversations that they're having um, and just insert yourself in as many departments as possible. Um, I did a lot of treatment writing, so a treatment is um, a essentially a pitch document that you use to uh, try and bring alive on the page what an idea for a um, advert or a short film or a music video will be. You could be a video game writer, that's really exciting. I did a bit of video game writing when I was about 27 on Need for Speed, that was really cool. Technical writing jobs, you could be a bid writer writing bids for financial companies, a medical writer, that was never really much interest to me, but um, go wild. <laughs> I also did some speech writing for the Liberal Democrats um, for Tim Farron's doomed, uh, was it 2000 and 2017? I was gonna say 2015, it was 2017, wasn't it? When he ran and it just tanked. Uh, I hope that wasn't to do with my speech writing, but um, possibly. Number one, write. I know that sounds really obvious, um, but if you want to be a writer and you're not writing, forget about it. If you want to be a filmmaker and you're not making films in your spare time, forget about it. Regardless of your economic circumstances, like your gift, that's, that's your gold. I don't mean that you need to be writing all the time, um, but you need to have a deep motivation to get words out onto a page because if you don't have that, it's just like, you're not gonna have the drive to sustain yourself over 10 years of trying to make it. You just need to be creating content, especially at the moment where there's so many content options, so many platforms where you can self-publish, like just get shit out there and collect it all in one place so that when you apply for those internships, when you apply for those jobs, you can go look at this work where you can say, I don't have any work experience, but look at my talent. That's really important, that's, that, that's your gift. Have lots of irons in the fire at the same time and work fucking hard. Do two things at once, always. Um, that's what I've done my whole career and it's the only way that I've been able to survive is when I'm working at RBS, I'm also writing reviews for someone else. When I'm doing an internship, I'm also writing the first chapters of my book. Um, when I am doing a commercial job, I'm spending my lunch times writing treatments for my newest screenplay. 
like you always have to try and find ways to like fit time into other time and to give your writing space like in an ideal world you would have hours and hours every day to do that so it didn't feel like a cram but if you don't have any money and you've never had money you've got to work you've got to work and until you can earn money doing what you love doing your writing like you're going to have to find a way tip number three is join a community there's this romantic idea of, of the kind of solitary writer that's just happy sitting at a desk alone with a candle and like fuck that um you don't need to be lonely and you don't need to be an island as a writer i think i started out with that with that mindset mainly because i hadn't met any other writers it's hard to meet them or at least it used to be i'd say not so much anymore there are plenty of groups out there um meetups go to launches go to readings um join unions like go to everything go to everything while you've got the time and the energy uh and make friends and talk about your writing because nothing will make you a better writer number four diversify your investments i got told that by a financial advisor the first and only meeting i've ever had with a financial advisor um and he was saying like you need like different income streams like you might have a bit of income from your house, from your book, from your screenwriting, from your commercials, and each of those income streams in and of itself is not very large, um, but it means that if the shit hits the fan and something goes wrong in three of them, then you've still got a little pot that you can draw on. Um, and I think that's really important for writers to understand. Like, um, you know, some people are just novelists and that's all they do. But most writers I know are kind of uh, have their fingers in lots of different writing pies. <laughs> uh, you know, they might contribute to The Guardian or they might do a lecture or they might have that screenplay that they're chipping away at that doesn't make them any money but might do one day. And they might also have a day job. Like, you know, you kind of, it's, it's really wise to um, not put all your eggs in one basket. Number five, apply for funding and benefits wherever and whenever you can. Um, when I was applying for university, at, at the time my mum was very sick um, and there was very little money at home and I applied for a bunch of educational grants to help me go to university. I think I found it literally through looking in the paper and going to the local library. This was very early internet stages. Um, there are local trusts and there's money, there are pots of money out there for people who haven't grown up with financial privilege. So just try and find where those pots are. Number six, if you're gonna work for free, make sure you're getting value out of it. It's a real catch-22 and it's a conversation that I've had with a lot of writers over the years is like, this can be a really, this could be a really amazing, uh, this could be a really amazing opportunity for me, but they're not offering any money and that will be familiar to anyone who works in the creative industries. So, oh uh, yeah, I mean, it'll be a great experience. It'll be a great thing to have on my showreel, great thing to have in my book, but, um, but yeah, there's no money. And it's really tricky to know what to do in that situation. And there have been times where I've pushed back and been like, you know what? Nah, I need to get paid, um, especially in recent years, and the work's gone away, and I've been like, well, fuck it, like, I don't, you know, I don't need to take that work anymore. There's also been times when um, I have worked for free, and the, the value that I've got from those projects, whether it's, like, making a short film for, like, three weeks and learning how to use editing software, like these are all like skills that you're learning and contacts that you're making. So if you're going to work for free, make sure it's truly valuable for you in tangible ways. And the reason I say that is because your skills are valuable just because they're soft skills. Whole industries are built on soft skills. Like you're the talent. Remember that like you have the goods and you need to know your worth and stand up for it. That's really, really important. Should I be employed or self-employed? That's a really tricky one. I, I spent 
nine out of ten years of my writing career so far. Do you know what I'm saying? Ten years, not ten years, twelve years. I've spent eleven out of twelve years of my writing career uh, self-employed, and that's served me really, really well um, because freelance day rates tend to be much higher than uh, the equivalent on a salary. And also it kind of gives you the flexibility to drop a project and pursue another one if, 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 if you need, if something comes in or, I don't know, it just, it gives you freedom. Um, and then in January, uh, 2020, I took on a part-time three days a week creative directing job, um, which gave me three days of guaranteed income and also left me with the rest of the week to pursue my own projects. And that was the first, that felt like a big step for me. Um, that was the first time I'd done that essentially since I'd been 25, first time I'd been employed. And like, thank God I did because then coronavirus hit and the world turned upside down. So if you'd asked me six months ago, I would say absolutely go out on your own, set up your own company, do your thing, be your own free writing agent. But uh, that's a really risky strategy now. Personally, I, right now, um, I'm so I'm so glad to have the support of an employer. Um, that's it. That's it. How do I do an unpaid internship when I'm broke? That's so difficult. That's so difficult because often internships are the gateway into a career. Um, and I actually, I actually kind of hate that employers offer unpaid internships. I think it's, um, I think it's bullshit. After uni, when I moved back to my mum and dad's in West Midlands, I lived there for a few months when I was working at RBS. Um, and I was from there in Stourbridge near Birmingham. I was applying for internships in London. And I applied for this one internship at, um, as a kind of a well-known entertainment brand that has like venues and puts on events. They loved my work, my little bits of writing that I'd been doing up to that point. Um, I would have been 21 at the time, 22. And they emailed me back and said, great, 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 when can you start? And I was like, um, I knew it was unpaid, but I was like, are you able to cover my expenses? And the 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 gaffer emailed me back and said no sorry we don't cover expenses so I had to turn it down and then a few years later I read an article written by said gaffer in the Telegraph and he's yeah he's a, a sort of well-known uh, London media mogul complaining about gentrification and and how um, it was preventing um, kids from poor backgrounds from accessing the industry and I was just like you fucking bullshitter so so I tweeted at him um I didn't call him a fucking bullshitter but I just pointed out that x number of years ago he had uh he had refused to pay my expenses um that, that meant that I my access to his industry had been blocked um and he, he apologized profusely the reason I tell that story is because um, your be vocal, stand up for yourself, um, stand up for what you think is right. Your pluck might be the thing that makes someone give you a, a job one day and don't let anybody make you think that you're less um, because you don't have the privileges that they had. I don't want to romanticize having grown up with very little money because it was really difficult at times, but um, I also don't think my writing would be what it is today without that. And um, there's a there's a, a richness that comes from growing up in uh, communities where there's not very much money. Because when there's not very much money, people have to make their own fun, and you grow up around um, eccentrics that inevitably feed into who you are, feed into your DNA and come out on the page. And um, I think that's really precious and really valuable and never underestimate that. Should I do a degree? If you come from a line of people who haven't been to university, the idea of going to university can be such a point of pride in a family 
and my dad hadn't been to university and I, know, I remember he really wanted me to go to Oxford and I had an interview and I flunked it to fuck because these like Oxford professors, you know, I was just sat in front of these two dudes applying to do modern history at St. Catherine's in Oxford and they were like, hello. <laughs> Mate, I I don't know, like I'm really sorry. I, I don't even understand what you're asking me. Um, I'd never met people that were that posh before and it was intimidating and weird. And I was up against people who'd been groomed for positions like that since they were 11 years old. So I didn't get in and I remember my dad being really disappointed. Um, so I, I do understand, I ended up going to Leeds by the way and much, much better off for it. But I understand that, um, that uni can be a point of pride and an aspiration, but it's also really, really fucking expensive. Um, I don't even know how expensive it is now. Um, but yeah, I, I came out of it with 18 grand's worth of debt, which I'm still paying off. And I don't think I ever really understood, understood that I would have that, I you know in twenty in fifteen years time you're still going to be saddled with debt. Um, I've still got six grand of debt, um, which is not nothing. And honestly, in terms of career, my degree was fairly useless. The only time I needed a degree was for that first internship I had at that um, doing the reviews. Uh, at that time out rival um, and they were like you need a degree to apply but my right my writing I don't think was any better out the other side of getting my degree which is saying something or I don't think it had improved by virtue of the fact that I was growing up as a person but I think I could have found ways for it to improve otherwise and to be honest I would have probably just lied about the fact that I had a degree anyway <laughs> Like, a, a, you know, that's literally the only time I've ever been asked. I think if you're a self-motivated person, you can educate yourself and you can, one, read well and actually know the classics because they're really important and give yourself a good literary historical education and get a good bird's eye view of, of where you're coming from as a writer, whatever your cultural background. Um, if you can do that off your own steam, I don't see why you should spend 18 grand uh, getting fucked up five nights a week, doing all the booze and the drugs, just for the experience of living away from home. I don't know, I reckon if I'd have moved down to London and I got a junior, office junior position at a production company, I would have been better off. And two, uh, learn story structure. I'd say that's the one thing that has been the common thread through all the different types of writing that I've done, whether it's a book or articles or screenwriting. Um, or even commercials, the one thing is structure. You have to, not that your writing should be rigid, but you need to learn the rules so that you can break them. Like learn your three act structure, learn your five act structure, like understand what causes the rise and fall in tension across a big piece of work. Um, a lot of that is intuitive and you know it in your heart, but it's really valuable and really important to to understand why you feel it in your heart, like what is it specifically about the nuts and bolts of the writing that makes you feel the way you do. Um, if you can get the reading, get the structure understanding as part of your education in a self-motivated way, I don't see why anyone would spend 18 grand these days, frankly, on getting a degree. I think if you know what it's like to, to be a child and to watch your parents struggle and to know what it's like to worry about money, I don't think that ever really leaves you, even when you start making money. Uh, I remember when I bought, where, after I sold my book for the adaptation and the show came out and I bought myself a flat, I felt really embarrassed. <laughs> I felt like I didn't really own it. I would like to be able to really step into my career and feel like I own it, but uh, actually I feel like the whole thing has been f a fluke and you hear writers across the board say that, um, that I feel like an imposter. Um, and I think that's because we tend to be quite introspective people. I'd like to not feel like that, but then also I wonder, would I, would I, would I even bother trying to 
get my voice out there if if I had that god-given self-assurance that so many people that I meet seem to have um I don't know if you're a young person and you're and you want to make a career out of writing then absolutely 100% go for it with all of your heart and um be prepared that it's gonna hurt you know and that it's gonna be full of compromises but the things that you think of as your weaknesses will probably become your strengths and that's a story in and of itself